Do we have to watch our language? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you ever watch your language? <laughs> Fucking hey! <laughs> <laughs> like... I want to be close enough to you ah. that when you get out of line, I can just reach across and swat you with the arm that, that got devastated in the motorcycle accident, but it's coming back. I still can, I can still nail yeah. you. We talked earlier, and one of the things that we both agree on, and that's what the healing force is. Yeah. Um, talk about that. Well, I just, I, as corny as it sounds, I just think that love is very, very, very powerful. Uh, and I think that the difference between a therapist who's marginally effective and one who's very effective oftentimes isn't how smart they are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of intangibles that go into that equation. I think being smart and being well educated are very, very helpful. But, but I think that a, a capacity to really uh, non-judgmentally appreciate anybody yeah. that walks into yeah. their yeah. your room and to love them not because to get into heaven or something or because you should i'm not very good at shoulds and shouldn'ts but love them because you just recognize that this yeah. person's yeah. got their own story yeah. they deserve yeah. my reverence yeah. and respect yeah. and when i spend any time with them i find i just naturally like them and love them yeah. and yeah. and i don't do that by dint of will because i think it i should but because it happens naturally, and I also think that that sets the table for for them to be able to open up to things that they may not even know about themselves, right. because it's like a, a contracted muscle when you put it under a heat lamp, yeah. and that heat lamp, as that warmth starts to work into yeah. that muscle, it just yeah. naturally, yeah. Yeah. It naturally opens up and expands. Right. And I think that love and non-judgmentalism right. and yeah. compassion in every instance, yeah. sustained love and compassion and non-judgmentalism yeah. has the effect that people around us feel safer. Yeah. And when we feel safer, we're better able to admit our own foibles, yeah. our own failures, yeah. our own limitations, yeah. our own fears, yeah. our own guilt, our own sadness, our own madness, yeah. our own craziness, yeah. and start to come to terms with it. Right. Right. And, and I think yeah. what a good therapist does is just set the tone that in this room anyway, yeah. yes. this is a sanctuary, yes. and, your story and this is, is safe, here, right? this is safe. Okay. It's what you want in any good relationship, whether yeah. it's a friendship or a love relationship. Yeah. You know, you, you create a sanctuary where the person you learn yeah. experientially, yeah. this person is safe. Yeah. This person yeah. is clear-eyed and is not here to judge me to weigh me, to compete with me, this person's here yeah. to love me. Yeah. Yeah. And th because of that, I can share with them things I couldn't share with somebody else. Good. They're safe. Yeah. 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 And it's stupid to share loaded stuff with somebody who's not safe, somebody who's going to yeah. file it in their history yeah. and call it up to you later, you know, who's going to use it to control you, yeah. or who's yeah. even going to use it to try to fix you because they're the fixer and you're the you know, a good therapist is very aware of her or his foibles, limitations, their own pain, their own capacity for depression or sadness or madness or whatever it is. Yeah. They know experientially they got all those things going. Yeah. So who are they to judge anybody else? Right. Yeah. In yeah. some ways, yeah. their own liabilities make yeah. them safer to be with yeah. and make them have a level of expertise about dealing with them that you wouldn't get with somebody yeah, yeah. who got their expertise out of a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, look at that dog. Yeah. He's my, he's my uh, guru. He's my guru. Are we talking about he doesn't spend that, all tail, his time, telling, that he doesn't, tail telling us something that then? He doesn't spend his time thinking about stuff or strategizing. Oh, to be a dog. He doesn't spend any time worrying about death, his impending death. It's here right now. This rug and how that sun feels on my, on my butt and, uh, and how if, if these guys get over all their talk and I'm going to get a walk. Mm -hmm. And kibbles at the end of the day. Yeah, so let's take a break. Ah, one, two, three. Ah,
Yes. You're not helping me, Siri. <laughs> Siri, you betrayed me. Nice to see somebody else does that besides me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to quit sleeping with Siri. <laughs> She's betrayed me. <laughs> She's clearly not trustworthy. <laughs> uh, I switched the voice to a male voice. Uh, you know you can do that. Yeah, I know, but... Yeah, and there's I, also an Aust Australian voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. I kind of yeah. like the Australian voice, Yeah, actually. yeah, 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 yeah. I like Siri. Uh, what you doing? What's, uh, what's up with the Yacht Club? Well, that's just a really good place to sit over there if they're serving the hot dogs and stuff. Oh. Sit oh, there, up, uh, oh, sit oh. up on the deck there. Oh, we're going to sit on the deck and chat over there and yeah. bring Tom along? Yeah, right. absolutely. Cool. Well, we don't, well, we can, no, 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 let's get something quick here. Let's not go over there. Okay. John. Oh, this is some good stuff here. This is some good stuff here. We've got the good stuff in the bottom, in the bottom of the, the bottom drawer. You want treats? What do you want? The Baileys. You want Baileys? No, I don't want Baileys, but that's, <laughs> yeah, I guess, that's the good yeah, stuff. I got a Baileys there, yeah. yeah, yeah Every now and then, if I've been particularly good. <laughs> The hell? That's okay, huh? Yeah, that's the way it's made. Oh. It's got cheese and stuff in it. Oh. You'd think a cheese head would know better, huh? Yeah, it's true. Really, it's fancy ass bread. That's why you don't uh, understand it. <laughs> so that's bread. It's got a very special poison in it, Mike. <laughs> Got a very special what? Yeah, poison. <laughs> it was uh, it was sold to me as poison. It's, it's actually food for the rats. What are you talking? So I, I didn't know it was strong enough, so I just saved it for a while. <laughs> With you in mind. <laughs> I think it's, a, oh. it's appropriate that you're being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> this would be like the last temptation of Christ. <laughs> I was never a bad kid. But I was in a lot of trouble in school. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. yeah. I had, uh, I have really exaggerated uh, ADD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, it didn't play well in a Catholic school. Yeah where you're supposed to sit in your seat right, yeah. and pay attention. Yeah, yeah, right. Sitting in your seat was impossible. Paying attention right. was even more impossible. Right, right, right. So, you know, I got my A's and marched, but I never got passing grades in conduct, what they call conduct. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, when I told Sister Janet in the eighth grade that I was thinking about going to the seminary, she broke up in laughter. <laughs> <laughs> she just thought that she just thought that was the funniest damn thing. She had she had made me sit in the cloakroom, you know, the old uh, yeah, class, yeah, classrooms yeah, with the cloakroom yeah, off the side. She had put me in the cloakroom as a kind of last resort, and I, I sat in there with you know, a desk, overhead light bulb, and two doors closed for large portions of every day. Uh -huh. And then during when she was making presentations that she thought I should have access to, she could open the front end ah. of the cloakroom, but I had to sit back far uh. enough that I could only see a couple of students and her. Uh -huh. I couldn't see the rest of the class because I was always distraction doing something that right. distracted the class right. so going to the seminary wasn't a natural Expectation, choice of anybody right. that I had terrorized yeah. for eight years right. Right. and uh, uh, my, wasn't my parents either my parents were not happy about it yeah. Yeah. they were not into my son the priest it was not not a routine in our family right. And to an extent that I didn't appreciate, uh, I had served a very valuable function in the family 
by being the kid that was always out of line, the kid that was always stirring things up, the kid that was always doing yeah. something that made yeah. life more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it didn't sit well with anybody, actually. So did you have a more difficult time with fill in the blanks than you did with multiple choice? Multiple choice is easy. Yeah. And, it shouldn't, it shouldn't and, have been, and, fill, and fill in the blanks was harder. And essays were particularly hard? No, no, I, I could write. I was very fluid. Which is unusual for ADD kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know I could, though. Yeah. Uh, well, my mother taught English. Ah, okay. And we didn't have a TV ah. in our house. Oh. We didn't get a TV until I was, I think, in my last year of high school, first oh. year of college. Okay. Um, because my dad thought it was, well, we didn't have much money, but my dad also just thought it was a passing thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ned really had a vision. <laughs> and my mother thought that uh, reading books was better than watching TV anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So we read books. Yeah. And the three of us would go to the library and leave with each of us eight, nine books yeah. a week. And we would take the books home and we would read them when everybody else was watching TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, words came easy and mm -hmm. reading came easy. I was always a slow reader, but I was yeah. uh, remembered and such. But I went to the seminary when I said that it saved my life. Uh, it gave me a structure that I wouldn't have found any place other than maybe a reform school. Where, you know, we were up at quarter to five in the morning, we were in chapel by right. six thirty, we were yeah. at breakfast at seven o'clock or seven fifteen, yeah. we were in first class yeah. at eight o'clock, we had classes all the way through, we were in study hall from yeah. schedule from, was filled. Yeah. Stem to stern. Right. Yeah. We got out of study hall at nine o'clock at night yeah. and we went to bed. Because we had to be up at yeah. Yeah. that time in the morning. And uh I'm not saying I was particularly good at it, mm -hmm. but I got it put enough boundaries around yeah, my yeah, life right, right. that I I did Give well. Give you structure. I yeah. did well. I, yeah, yeah. So this is this this is really good. If you like, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Really? Yeah. yeah this yeah. you said lunch. Yeah. I got lunch. Yeah. I, well, You're not eating. Well, lunch for Tom. Oh, lunch for Tom. Well, how's he going to eat lunch? Well, we have to feed you. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm on the clock right now. I mean, well, who did I get lunch for here? You got any other smart ideas? You got any other smart ideas? Jeez, kid. I really enjoy ADD kids. I've enjoyed working with them for a lifetime. And the the uh, the other thing that's so uh, I guess unusual about them is that uh, for ADD kids, the harder they try, the worse they do. Uh, and I, hmm. you know, uh, it's new to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and I was raised to always try harder. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yes. And I, I think that backfired. Uh, I mean, it it, it 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 seems so intuitive that you have to try hard to do good. Mm -hmm. And when it when it's the harder you try, the worse you do. Well, that just gets you to try harder, which creates even worse, which creates harder, which cycles you down. Also, it takes a little, erodes your self-esteem. Yeah, right. Because right. no matter what you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So you're not going to eat any of this, right? Uh, under, under the heading of ADD here, you know, I'm... <laughs> I get this damn something for you to eat and you don't eat it. Well, you know, if you're... Are you just messing with me? If your intention Are you just was messing to be with loving me? and to be kind, I accept. And I'll stick my finger in it if you really oh, like it. <laughs> no, get away from me. Come on, let's go sit over here. Did Tom get something to eat? No, John wouldn't let him eat. Oh. I offered it to Tom, but I um, said I wasn't going to feed you. Okay. I wasn't going to. All right, all right. You know, all right. I mean, there's okay. limits to how far I'm going to go. This early in a relationship. So let me tell you how I understand anxiety. Okay. Here's how I understand anxiety. I think anxiety is really. Uh, fear that we're just not consciously aware of, uh, and uh, so we got to make up another name for it, and we call it anxiety. Uh, but pretty clearly to me, it has all the telltale signs of fear. 
Mm-hmm. Just, and uh, my, my sense of where anxiety comes from is uh, scenario building. Uh, people build scenarios in their heads. And the, it's interesting because mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. of these scenarios as both life-saving and life-damaging. If you have a scenario that says, oh man, I, I, I imagine a, a somebody breaking into the house, I've got to lock the doors to make sure nobody can break into the house, and you go lock your doors, you may have saved your house. Uh, but if you have that same scenario about somebody breaking into the house, and nobody's breaking into the house, but you're stuck on it, and it replays over and over in your head, and it gets into your sleep, and it gets into your dreams, and you start having anxiety attacks, uh, uh, then it's a problem. So this same act, scenario building, can both be self-protective and also self-damaging. So, so uh, example, when, when people come to me and they want to, they're afraid of flying. Okay, and uh, they want to be able to get on an airplane and, and uh, not be afraid. I know they've got a scenario in their head and I don't ask them, uh, you know, do you have a scenario in your head? I tell them to tell me about the scenario in your head. That way we don't have to go through all those other steps. And they, they always have a scenario, John. And the scenario involves the plane crashing and, uh, uh, and them getting killed or whatever. And, uh, and, and many times, they weren't even aware they had a scenario until I, until I mentioned it to them. Um, and, and see, I, that, that to me is the way the unconscious mind works. Uh, we just don't, we are these awesome learning machines that don't much pay attention to what we learn and how we work. Uh, that's my sense of human nature and who we are and how we are. What are your, what are your thoughts? Well, I'd use different words. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. We don't disagree on a lot of it. Yeah. Probably don't disagree on any of it, even though I'd like to. It's so much more interesting to disagree with you <laughs> than to go along. <laughs> I think pretty oh, yeah. obviously, yeah. fear is instinctual initially, mm-hmm. and it's the recoil part of it is to save our sorry asses. And we grew up for these thousands of years in mm-hmm. danger at right. risk. Right. People right. who were most vigilant and had the strongest fear response and the fo- strongest fight response for that matter mm-hmm. yep. and the strongest flee response right. are the ones who survived. Yeah. So we come from a whole group of people who have yeah. very refined sensitivities yeah. right. uh, and awareness, attention right. and very refined ways of responding there's, there's protectively. A, there's a great demonstration of that on the internet. Uh, if you look up under the uh, Amygdala hijack. Uh, that's what that's what that's called. Mm-hmm. The amygdala is the part of your brain that uh, deals with fear and the fight or flight response. And uh, uh, an amygdala hijack is uh, essentially when the fear hijacks your brain. Uh, and uh, and and uh, guys with PTSD uh, have a lot of amygdala hijacking. That's what happens to them. Uh, they well, so a so generalized response or so. Yeah. Yeah. Overwhelming response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That essentially controls yes, how you I, think I, and how you act. That's right, and I, I think of it as a broken amygdala. I think guys with PTSD have broken amygdalas, so they they do not deal well with uh, uh, fear, fight or flight. Uh, they have lived in situations where everybody in their world was trying to kill them, but their own buddies that were trying to save them. Uh, surrounded. Uh, you, you talk to Vietnam guys and how many times they were surrounded by the enemy or overrun by the enemy. Uh, and it's, it's that whole fear of being overrun and having everybody in your unit be killed. Uh, my God, that's just such a powerful fear that it mm-hmm. invades you for a lifetime. You can do a walk first and then ice cream? Or ice cream first and then a walk? Let's see, let me guess what your preference is based on what you just said and did. Okay. Huh? I know you knew to not take that front spot because that was safe for me. Oh. Really? Remember I told you about God saving me the front spot? God directed you in the front spot. Well, the reason I took it is because I know I'm much healthier than you are and I can walk further. Sure, that's what God told you to get, to get over it. 
he was actually getting telling me. So it was it wasn't bad enough to have your delusional system be just your own. You, no. you had to wrap God into it too. God's always been part of my delusional system. Where was he when the CIA detected the squirrels? In this, uh, <laughs> I never should have told you about them damn squirrels. Well, I think I walked in at one point and you had a hand, you had a glass in your hand and it told me you've been standing on the uh, radiator. Hello. You've got some chocolate raspberry. Dark Lincoln chocolate Bush raspberry. 84. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah, I'll show you right where those are. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, Yeah. You weren't even alive in 84. No. <laughs> what do we got? Oh. Are you, uh, are you up to this? I, yeah, I got a film right now. I can't. Okay, well. Can you get a mini? Well, give a mini. We'll take a yeah, I'll pay for a mini, and, we'll, okay. and we'll, when we get them in the car, we'll get yeah, sure them to them. All right. Told today's gonna be $12. Oh, and you got the raspberry. Oh my god, these are expensive. I know. I think it was. I'd say they're worth it though, for sure. They have the same common denominator as the other one, the chocolate falls off. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's pretty good though, isn't it? Yeah. That can be too. Good. Yeah. No, this is a nine. Get that double chocolate. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm.